And so as a means of introduction to the series, I want us to begin all the way back to Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis 3 is where we're going to be just for a few moments. And I want us to see in the story of the fall, in the story of the disobedience of Adam and Eve, three primary effects, three primary consequences of sin entering the world because this picture has affected every single one of us in this room. Three effects of sin once Adam and Eve ate from the tree. Genesis 3, if you look at verse 7, it says, The eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The very first consequence of sin when sin entered the world was guilt. Adam and Eve knew that they were guilty before God. And listen, we know we're guilty before God. We don't need anyone to tell us. It wasn't just that they realized that they were naked. They had lost their innocence here. All of a sudden, the sting of their conscience was felt, and they knew the difference between right and wrong, and they knew that they had done wrong. They knew that they needed to do something to try and hide that. So they made coverings for themselves. We are guilty before God. And at this point, guilt has now been passed on to all humanity, right and wrong. And the overwhelming sense that all of us have at some point that we've done wrong, that we are guilty before God. The second effect of sin is that we have shame before God. It says in verse 7 that the eyes of both of them were open. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. They made loincloths for themselves. And then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. See, what's interesting is if you go back to Genesis 2 and you look at verse 25, it says that man and wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Up until this point, they had no shame. Shame, But now when sin enters the world, here they are hiding from God, ashamed to even be in front of God. And the shame leads to blame. Adam blames Eve and then ultimately says, God, this is your fault. Shame leads to blame. And here we have a picture of shame before God and as a result of sin, a loss of honor in the presence of God. We're guilty before God. We have shame before God. And third, we're afraid of God. It says, but the Lord called the man and said, where are you? Verse 10, it says, He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And this is a drastically different picture from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, because up until this point, we see man and woman naked, but we see them enjoying the presence of God. We see them basking in the presence of God. We see them rushing into the presence of God, pouring out their love and affection when God's presence was there. But now in Genesis 3, when God's presence shows up, they run in fear. They're scared to be anywhere near him. Terror has now replaced what once used to be joy because of the arrival of sin. They knew they had done something wrong. They were ashamed of that. And in trying to cover that up, they hid from God. They were afraid of him. Listen, if you and I, we don't understand the gravity of Genesis 3, we're not going to understand the rest of the Bible. If we in any way try to minimize the seriousness of sin in Genesis 3 like we are tempted to do in our own lives, then we'll miss the whole point of why we need the gospel. And at this point, man was separated from God for all eternity. So he was afraid for good reasons. In Genesis 2, God says, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. We've got to realize that at this point in Genesis 3, it makes complete sense for God to leave man and women in their guilt in their fear, in their shame. If we desire justice, at this point, what we desire is we desire our own death and our separation from God forever. This is an extremely serious picture here. This is the problem. This is our sin, and it leads to guilt and shame and fear. And yet the story doesn't leave with, end with God leaving man alone. We see in Genesis 3 that God seeks after the guilty. He pursues Adam and Eve, even in the midst of their sin. He covers their shame. And he protects the fearful. All three of those are components in biblical salvation. But I think you and I, we have this tendency to isolate some of those and just simply focus on one or the other. We talk to many people who know that they're innocent before God because Jesus has washed away their sins. We know we're not guilty because of our sins, but we still walk around with shame. We still walk around in fear. Many of us know we're right before God, but how many of us are still plagued 
by all kinds of fears in this world. We're afraid that no matter what we do, we can somehow give the devil a foothold, but we don't understand that greater is he that's in us than it's in the world. And we live in fear. And so what I want to do over the next several weeks is look at each of these consequences of sin and how the gospel addresses them. These three emotions have become the foundations of three types of cultures. There's the guilt-innocence culture. And these are mostly individualistic societies, mostly Western societies, where people who break the law are guilty and they seek justice or forgiveness to rectify a wrong. And we're going to spend the rest of the morning looking at how the gospel addresses this culture. But there's also the honor-shame culture. These are collectivistic societies common in the East, East Asian, South Asian. In this culture, people shamed for fulfilling group expectations seek to restore their honor before the community. Finally, there's the fear power culture. These refer to animistic cultures, tribal, African. We see them even in South Asian cultures where people are afraid of evil and harm. They pursue power over the spirit world through magic rituals or what they do or don't do. And as we've become more of a diverse church, it hit me recently that we have people in our community that come from all three of these cultures. We also have three cultures represented in our community, and we need to know how to share the gospel with them. Someone that comes from an honor-shame culture isn't going to respond to the gospel in the same way that someone responds in a guilt-innocence culture. They aren't thinking about their own individual sins as much as the shame that they bring on their family or on their community. So we need to know how the gospel responds to honor and shame and guilt and fear. So this morning we're going to look at the guilt culture and what the gospel says to those of us who are living in guilt and can't seem to get over it. Some of the basic foundations upon which the Western culture is built is an obsession with being right and wrong or guilty or innocent. We talk about our rights. What is right for me? We cling to our rights. We hold on to our rights. These are privileges. We have debates. We spent countless hours, countless money on debating whether or not homosexuality is right or wrong. Is abortion right or wrong? Is this particular war right or wrong? Is immigration right or wrong? All of it is defined in the essence of right and wrong. This is the unspoken goal of our culture. I want to be right, I want to be okay, and I want you to be okay. We even seek to redefine our own morals to classify ourselves as right. We redefine what is right and wrong in order to make ourselves feel okay. Now listen, that's not to say that talking about the gospel in terms of right and wrong, guilty or innocent, is wrong at all. Some of you are thinking, what's wrong with that? And if that's what you're thinking, you just proved my point by what you're thinking. And what I want to see over the next few weeks is that throughout the scriptures that there's almost this picture, a threefold thread of God, just like we saw in Genesis 3, God seeking after those who feel guilt, God covering the shameful, God protecting the fearful. They all come together and portray a holistic picture of the gospel. Guilt is a universal experience. We all know the feeling of guilt when we've done something wrong. We go through a red light, and you ro or you roll through a stop sign. We get that feeling that the blue lights behind us only seek to confirm, right? And we know you've done something wrong. When you say something to wrong to your wife, and her countenance changes, her appearance changes, you know that what you just said you should not have said. You know that you're, you've done something wrong. There's a sense in which we know, even from a young age, what's right, what's wrong. There are all kinds of ways that we try to overcome our guilt. There are intellectual ways that we try to overcome our guilt. We try to convince ourselves, well, I'm just human. I don't need to feel guilty for this. This is what everybody would do. This is what everyone else is doing. Maybe we intellectually redefine our morals. We just redefine right and wrong to make ourselves feel better for what we find ourselves doing. There are physical ways that we deal with our guilt when we turn to all sorts of things to appease our guilt. Maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's drugs to cover up our guilt or deal with the guilt, or maybe it's not that extreme. Maybe it's the busyness of our lives in an attempt to cover up our guilt. That as long as we can stay busy, we don't have to come face to face with what we're really not doing with our lives or what we are doing with our lives. Maybe we trivialize, trivialize guilt by 
engrossing ourselves in sports or hobbies, by becoming a fan of this team or that team. And so we look at life as fun and not have to deal with the seriousness of life. Intellectual ways, physical ways, but there are also religious ways that we deal with guilt. And this is probably the most deceptive at all, deceptive of all. But we come to God and we say, maybe if I could just do this. Maybe if I can give a little bit more. Maybe if I come to church every week. Maybe if I read my Bible, then I can overwhelm the, overtake the guilt that I'm experiencing. Maybe if I can do this, that will weigh more than the guilt of the sins that I've done. There are all kinds of ways the world would say, this is how you deal with guilt. Psychology offices are filled week in and week out with people struggling with guilt complexes, guilty for what they've done, guilty for what they haven't done, guilty for what others have done, guilty for anything and everything. What I want to submit to you this morning is that God answers, God's answer to the problem of guilt far surpasses anything that the world could offer us to overcome it. If guilt is a universal problem across this room and we all have things that we want to hide, all of us have some kind of baggage that we carry around when it comes to guilt, I think it would be good for us to look at what the gospel says about our guilt. Look with me in your Bibles to Romans 8, verse 1. If you don't know this verse, can I encourage you, this is a verse that all of us should know. And this is a verse that we should say to ourselves over and over and over. Romans 8 1 says, Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those of us in Christ Jesus. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those of us in Christ Jesus. The key words there is no condemnation. What does that mean? I'm convinced that this is the essence of Christianity. This is the central foundational message of the gospel. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in. Christ Jesus. I want us to picture, see some pictures of Jesus in the Gospels, his stories in the Gospels that will help enlighten us on what this means, this concept of no condemnation. And all of, this, all of these stories are going to lead us back to Romans 8. How does Jesus in the Gospels address our guilt? Three things I want you to see this morning. The first thing I want you to see is I want you to see the power of Jesus, the power of Christ. So I'm going to take you through several stories. We're going to be all over the place this morning. Flip your Bibles over to Mark chapter 2. Think about these stories from the perspective that says we're not just learning what these stories teach, but we're learning what these stories teach so that we can share it with others. This is intended not to stop with us, but that we can spread it through us. Mark 2 is an incredible story. The context here is in Mark 1 is that we got Jesus all over the place healing all kinds of diseases, healing all kinds of sicknesses. Mark 1, says that people were lined up in the town at his door waiting to be healed of their diseases and delivered from demons. And it's a pretty intense picture in Mark 1. And we get to see what Jesus' ministry is all about when we get to Mark 2. Read with me Mark 2, verse 1. It says, when he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together, there was no room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the message to them. And when they came to him, and they came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four men, since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof from above where he was, and when they had broken through, they lowered the stretcher on where, which the paralytic was laying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And right away, Jesus understood in his spirit what they were reasoning like this within themselves. And he said to them, why are you reasoning these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, pick up your stretcher and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, Get up, pick up your stretcher, go home. Immediately, he got up, picked up the stretcher, and went out in front of everyone. And as a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. I want you to see the picture of the power of Jesus. And I want you to see it on two different levels this morning. You've got to understand it on both levels to understand Mark 2. Level 1 Jesus has the authority to remove sins. 
Jesus has the authority to remove sins. These four guys bring this paralytic man on this mat. They rather unconventionally bring this man to Jesus. They lay him before him. Now, we just mentioned in Mark 1 that we see Jesus healing all kinds of different people. So people would expect Jesus to heal this man and for him to get up and walk. That's what was expected. But that's not what Jesus does. Verse 5, the first words he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now let's get a little backdrop here. Remember that in this day, especially in the Jewish mindset, for someone to have this kind of disease, this kind of paralysis, it would be attributed either to this man's sins or the sins of his parents or grandparents. Someone sinned, and because of their sin, this person is suffering. This is the judgment of God on this man's life. The reason he's paralyzed is because God is judging him. This guy, for however long he's been paralyzed, has been living with the stigma of being under the judgment of God for his sins. And so what we see Jesus doing is going right to the core of the issue. Jesus is not saying that this guy is under judgment for his sin or this person's sin, but by the fact that he's sick. Instead, the biblical truth across all scripture is that sickness, disease, and ultimately death are all a result of sin in the world. We know that because sin entered the world of Genesis 3, that's why we have suffering. That's why we have sickness. That's why we have death. Which is why creation is longing for a new creation to be made new. What we've got is disease and sickness and death as a result of sin in the world. And so Jesus goes right to the heart of the man's problem. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And that was a bold claim. Only God can forgive sins. And for Jesus to be able to forgive sins means that he is equating himself with God. And these religious leaders aren't buying it at all. They're wondering, who does this guy think he is? And so Jesus comes to them, and he knows exactly what they're thinking, a further evidence that Jesus is God. And he looks at them and says, you guys are thinking this, but what do you think is easier for me? For me to deal with the symptom of the paralysis or the root of this guy's life, his sin? And he says, in order for you to believe that I have the power to forgive sins, he turns around to the guy and he says, dude, get up, walk, take your mat and go home. And the man does it, and he's gone. Jesus has the power and the authority to remove sin. But second, Jesus has the authority to heal our suffering. Jesus has the authority to heal our suffering. Now these two go together with the power of Christ, the authority to remove sin and the authority to heal our suffering. The core issue is that at the heart, all of us in this room have sinned against the Holy God. Our guilt is not due to the fact that we failed others. Our guilt is due to the fact that we have failed God. The biblical truth is this. Every single one of us, without exception, will stand before God one day as an individual to give account for our lives. All of us. And that's a scary thought if you're trying to cover up your guilt with intellectual ways, physical ways, or even religious ways. Jesus comes to the core of the issue and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. In other words, this picture of no condemnation is illustrating the fact that Jesus comes to us and says, I forgive you. Your deepest need, right at the heart, right at the core of all our lives, he says, son, daughter, I forgive you. And then Jesus deals with our suffering. What about suffering? There are a lot of us suffering. Just this week has been one of the hardest weeks of pastoral ministry that many of you guys have suffered this week. Just in our community, we've had three or four of you guys that have lost loved ones this week from death, from sickness, from disease. It's been a hard week. There's suffering all around us. The thing is, in our pain and in our suffering, the devil, the adversary will come to us and he'll say, you see your suffering? That's a picture of condemnation. That's a picture of judgment. You've done something wrong. You are guilty. God is punishing you. That's why you're suffering. And it will begin to bring these thoughts into your mind. The reason I'm sick, the reason I'm struggling, the reason I can't seem to get a good job, the reason I'm going through hardships is because I've done something wrong and God is punishing me. And church, brothers, sisters, what do you do in those circumstances when the enemy comes to you and says you are guilty and you are judged and you are, God is punishing you, what do you say? Can I tell you what you should say? You should look at the adversary and you should say, on the contrary. There is no condemnation in my life. 
I have been forgiven at the core of my deepest need. I am forgiven of all my sins. And as a result, no matter what suffering, no matter what hurt, no matter what disease I face in my life, and no matter how long it lasts, even if it ends my life, I know that He has the power to heal my suffering for all eternity because He has shown His power and His glory most clearly in the forgiveness of my sins. Hallelujah. That's what we need to be able to say to the enemy. That he has the power to forgive my sins. So it doesn't matter what sickness I'm facing, what disease I'm facing. Because if he can remove my sins, he can remove anything else if he wants to. He has the authority, yes, to heal our suffering. But his power and his glory are shown most clearly when he forgives us of our sins. May we never, never underestimate that. May we never take away take the value away by saying, I know that Jesus can forgive my sins, but only if he could do this or only if he could do that. Listen, if he can forgive your sins, he can do anything else. He forgives our sins. He removes our sins from us. He looks at us, not all the symptoms of our lives, he looks at the core of our being and he says, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. There is no condemnation. I forgive you. Isaiah 43, I remember your sins no more. Jeremiah 31, I remember your sins no more. I forgive you. This is a picture of Mark 2. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. See the power of Christ. Number two, see the purpose of Christ. Let's go to our second story, John 3. We won't have time to read this because we just don't have time, but we've also did a sermon series on this in the Gospel of John. But John 3 is probably has one of the most famous verses in all the Scripture, and right in the middle of it, a verse for those who've never even been to church and never had anything to do with Christ or familiar with because you've seen John 3.16 on football signs everywhere, right? Um, We've got John 3.16 to the core. Let me recap the story for you. Nicodemus was this sharp religious leader, a leader of the Supreme Court, so to speak. He knew all the laws, and his job was to guard the laws. He was born a Jew, a part of the covenant people of God. He's a major teacher of the law and the scene in the first century. He comes to Jesus and he starts his conversation with Jesus in the middle of the night, and they start talking about the kingdom of God. Jesus looks at him and he says, you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And that perplexes Nicodemus. Put yourself in his shoes. You're thinking, I'm a Jew. I'm a part of the people of God. I'm actually a leader of the people of God. What do you mean I need to be born again? And Jesus begins to talk to Nicodemus about how Nicodemus has given his life to every religious rule and every religious law and regulation that he saw. The Pharisees even created more laws to follow. He's done all that he can do to earn favor in standing before God, to be right before God. And then Jesus comes onto the scene and he says, you did all of that. You did all this stuff and yet none of that counts. None of that matters. And then he goes, Jesus takes the story all the way back to Numbers and he talks about the serpent being raised. Back in Numbers, the people were wandering in the wilderness and they started rebelling against God. And so God sent snakes to kill the people. They began biting people and people are dying. This is not a very happy time among the people of Israel. And so Moses prays to God and says, God, save us. And God says, take a serpent, put it on a pole, put the pole high, and everyone who looks at the serpent will be saved as a result from dying as a result of these snakes. All you have to do is look. All you have to do is look. Why would Jesus use that example? Why would Jesus talk about a serpent in the Old Testament as an example of being born again? Because he's trying to communicate to Nicodemus that it's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's not about how well you can perform. It's almost like he's saying Nicodemus is in a room where all the door handles are way too high for him, and no matter how high he jumps, he's never going to be able to reach the door handle to be able to get himself out. It's impossible, Nicodemus. No matter how many rules and how many regulations and how many laws you follow, you cannot do it. All you have to do is look. All you have to do is look. Look where? Look at me. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish 
but have eternal life. It's not about how you can remove your guilt by following your religion and your laws and all your rituals. All you have to do is look at me and be saved. There's a huge truth in there for all of us in this room. In a culture where it's common for our lives, where we have to go to church Sunday in and Sunday out, that we can try to use what we do to appease the guilt of our lives. Or if we try to do it on our own, we will fall short. We need our guilt removed from us. I want you to see the purpose of Jesus here in the story of Nicodemus. The purpose of Jesus is twofold. Number one, he came to stop us from trying to remove the guilt on our own and stop us from our intellectual, physical, religious endeavors to try to get freedom in our hearts. He says, stop trying. You know why? Stop trying because God sent me. He sent me into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. It's not like Jesus comes into the world and says, I'm going to condemn these people and not these people. He says, no, Nicodemus, you don't realize that the entire world is condemned, including you, including me. We're already condemned in our sin. What you need is somebody to come in and not confirm your condemnation. You need somebody to come in and save you from your condemnation and you, that you already find yourself in. He says, you need to stop trying and you need to trust me. He came to us from trying and to teach us to trust him. He says, just look at me. Come out of the darkness of your sin, from hiding it up, from covering it up. Come out into the light. See who I am. Let your guilt be exposed. And here's the beauty of it. I will remove your guilt. And so he says to Nicodemus, who finds himself embroiled in effort after effort after effort to try to get to God, he says, Nicodemus, not only are you forgiven, but in John 3, he says, you can have a fresh start. You can have a brand new start. You can start over, Nicodemus. You don't have to continually make up for all the things in your past, all the guilt that was back there. You don't have to try to rectify those things. I've come to give you a brand new, clean start. You can be born again by the Spirit of God, and it won't be dependent on all those outward observances that you give yourself to. This is an inner life that I'm going to bring you. I will remove your guilt and I will give you a fresh start all by simply believing me, simply by trusting me. That's the story of John 3, that you can have a fresh start. Last story. Last point. I want you to see the paradox of Jesus. One more story. Flip over to John 8. John 8 is one of my favorite passages and we'll dive into this story when we get back into the book of John in January. The story may or may not be familiar with you. I want you to see this passage in the light of the fact that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read this passage. John 8, verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. What do you say? They asked us to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, The one that is among you, the one without sin among you, should be the first to throw a stone at her. And he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. And when they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. And when Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin no more. We've seen the power of Jesus in Mark 2. We've seen... The purpose of Jesus in John 3. I want you to see the paradox of Jesus in John 8. A paradox is two statements or two words when put together seem to contradict, like playoff bound cowboys, right? Um, But they don't necessarily often contradict. It happens every once in a while. You get those different things that come together and you wonder if they contradict each other. And what I want you to see is the ultimate paradox of all scriptures is in the person of Jesus when his humanity and his divinity come together. And the picture here is incredible. Here's the paradox. Jesus is passionately committed to upholding the justice of God. 
You see these guys come to Jesus, these teachers of the law, these religious leaders, and they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to basically put him in a no-win situation. They say to him, this woman has been caught in adultery, Jesus. You go all the way back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and you'll see that in the Mosaic law, that if a woman or anyone's been caught in adultery, they should be stoned. And so they wonder, Jesus, are you going to go against the law, Moses, and not stone her? If he says that, he's going to go against Moses' law. But if he says, all right, let's keep the law of Moses and stone her, then he's not going to be very popular. He'll be breaking Roman law because Romans will not allow people to just kill the other people. And it will also undermine the whole picture of compassion that we've seen in Jesus' life and ministry. So what does Jesus do? They think they've got him trapped by putting the law in front of him. And now, at this point, many people, when we read this passage, it seems that we somehow have this tendency to walk away from this passage saying that Jesus goes light on the law. That Jesus doesn't take the law seriously. But that's not what Jesus is doing at all. That we think that, oh, Jesus is all about grace, that there's no more law. But that's not what this passage is teaching at all. Jesus is passionately committed to upholding the law, the justice of God. He's not light on sin at all in this passage. In fact, he's heavier on sin in this passage than the guys who brought the accusation against the woman. Don't miss that picture here. Nowhere in John 8 does Jesus say that she should not be stoned. She doesn't, he does not say that. He doesn't say, no, 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 that's not what the law says. That yours, that's your interpretation. I'm going to redefine the law so that she can get out. It's almost like he takes that as a given. She should be stoned. He says, it's almost like you guys are right. The law says there's a very serious penalty for adultery, and that sin leads to death, even stoning, as it says in Deuteronomy. But he says, you know what? Let's take it to the next level. And you go to Deuteronomy, and you go to other places of the law, it talks about how an accusation like this has to be brought by more than one witness. And that person who's testifying against this person should be the first to throw a stone. And the law also states that these people have to be guiltless in the crime. So Jesus isn't minimizing the law here at all. Instead, he says, let's take the law to the furthest extent. Those of you who've kept the law, those of you who are fully righteous, those of you who are so passionate about the law, you should be the first ones to pick up the stones and throw it because you have always kept the law. And now all of a sudden, these guys start backing away. The oldest down to the youngest. This is an intense picture. Jesus said, let him who is without sin throw the first stone, and all of a sudden, there's no one left. We know in John, Jesus reiterates later that he is without sin. And now all of a sudden, this woman is standing in front of the one person who has the right and the ability to stone her. He has no sin. And he can stone her. He said, let him who is without sin throw the first stone. And that is Jesus and Jesus alone. And there they are face to face. And you've got Jesus upholding the justice of God. The woman is not encouraged at all at this moment because Jesus is still standing there. And he is innocent. He has never sinned. And now she finds herself face to face with the person who can actually make it happen. And what does Jesus do? He looks at her through the tears of her eyes and he says, where are they? Where are those people who condemned you? And she says, no one's here. They're all gone. And then the one who alone has the authority to condemn her looks at her and says, and neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What an amazing picture. The only one who has the authority to condemn her in this particular moment, in this particular circumstance, says, I don't condemn you. There is no condemnation. You say, where's the justice of God here? The justice of God is going to be seen in a few weeks from this point when Jesus walks on a road to a cross on the condemnation of this particular woman and those religious leaders and your sins and my sins are placed upon him. He radically upholds the justice of God a while at the same time extending the mercy of God. 
What an amazing picture of Jesus who says, I'm passionate about the law and I'm passionate about God's justice. Condemnation will be given. However, I will take the condemnation on myself instead of you, ma'am. Go and sin no more. And this is exactly that leads us up back to Romans 8. You remember the first part of Romans, Romans 1 and 2. Romans 1 all the way to Romans 3 is a horrible picture of our condemnation. The wrath of God is being revealed in heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men. It's not a pretty picture at all. Paul spends all the way to the middle of Romans 2 explaining how sinful the Gentiles are. And you can almost hear the Jewish leaders in the background saying, Amen, that's right, you tell them, Paul. These are horrible people. They deserve the wrath of God. And then Romans 2, Paul turns the table and turns on them and says, Now you, you call yourself a Jew? And you rely on the law and you brag about your relationship with God. And then he starts to lay it in onto the Jewish people. He says, you guys are blaspheming the name of God among the Gentiles. And he gets to the end and he says in Romans 3, 9, he says, there is no one righteous. Not even one. No one who understands. No one who seeks God. You've all turned away. You together have become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Our throats are open graves. Our tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on our lips. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Ruin and misery mark our way. The way of peace we do not know. There is no fear of God before our eyes. Whatever the law says, it says to all those who are under the law so that every one of our mouths will be silenced and the whole world accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become the consciousness of sin. Conscious of sin. In other words, the law only makes us more guilty. And I don't know, I can picture Paul, he gets to the end of verse 20 and he puts his ink pen down. And he pauses there for a second and you can see the tear in Paul's eyes as he's overwhelmed with the guilt of man before God. This is heavy. We're all under the judgment of God. Thankfully, Paul picks up his pen and he says to the person, this is one of the greatest transitions in all of Scripture and all of literature. He says in verse Romans 3, 21, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus to those who believe. There is a, no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and yet we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's a good verse for us to know as well. Not that we fall short but that we are freely justified by His grace through the redemption that comes through Jesus. This paradox now comes back in. How can God be just and also justify us in our sin? How can that be so? Romans 3, he continues, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice. Because in his forbearance he had left the sin committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so that so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. He's just. His condemnation is poured out. He justifies those who have faith in Jesus because his condemnation is poured out on his one and only son so that he can say to you and I, just like he said to that woman, neither do I condemn you. You are forgiven. You have a fresh start. You are free. Go and live in victory. He says amidst the emotional weight of your sin, you are free. Brothers, sisters, you are free. I don't know what your past has been like. I don't know what things that are weighing heavily on you this morning and are different times of your life. I don't know the guilt that you felt from falling short in this area or that area, or whether you fall short as a husband or a wife or as a teenager or as a co-worker or as, as a friend. I don't know where you fall short in this relationship or that relationship or in this thing or that thing that no one else knows about. I don't know all those things in your life, but I do know this. He said, that through Jesus you are free you're free you're free this is why when we get to Romans 8 it's such a glorious celebration because Jesus has justified us it is through faith in him 
Romans 4 and Romans 5 teaches us that well, we still struggle with our sins, don't we? We still struggle day in and day out with the sins of our lives. We still struggle with guilt and the fact that we don't find ourselves measuring up. Even crazy Paul in Romans 7 says, I don't understand what I do for what I want to do, I don't do. What I hate to do, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that it's no longer I that does it, it is sin living in me that does it. He gives us a headache just by trying to explain what he does and doesn't do. He gets to the end and he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is what precedes Romans 8. Is the struggle still real? No question. All through Romans 8, we see this picture of suffering. We see the Bible that we should, that we should consider our suffering not worth comparing to the glory that will one day be revealed to us. When Satan comes to each of our lives, to each of our minds, he says, you can't overcome what you did there. You can't hide that. You can't measure up. You shouldn't even be here for worship this morning. Who do you think you are singing? Who do you think you are worshiping? Who do you think you are? How can you make a difference for the kingdom of God? How can you do anything for God? He bombards us. He barrages our minds with these thoughts. I challenge you to look back at him and say these words. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against us to whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns Jesus Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God interceding for me? Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, shall hardship, shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger of sword, or guilt, or sin, or anything? No. In all these things I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, in the present or in the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the gospel. You don't have to walk in guilt. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. So regardless of whether you are struggling with the guilt of what you did on the internet last night at 2 a.m. or what you did this whole week in your business or what you're struggling with over the last six months or the last six or 10 or 20 or 30 years that you just can't seem to get rid of, regardless, I want to remind you that upon the authority of Jesus, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. You have a fresh start. You are free. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. His promise fills the scripture as he speaks to us. And he says, you are spotless. You are forgiven. You and I, with all the filth of our lives, are called spotless by the Almighty God. Blameless. Holy. Righteous. You're dressed in the righteousness of God himself. You're faultless. You're whole. You're clean, you're pure, you're pardoned. Praise be to God, you are not guilty anymore. By the blood of Jesus, you are not guilty anymore. This communion table reminds us that God is just. He doesn't take our sins lightly. that Jesus took our place so that this morning when we are here we stand pure and holy not, judged, not sitting here based on what we've done or how much we failed but we sit here as sons and daughters of Almighty God you're not guilty you're not condemned you are the child of of Almighty God. This morning as we come to the table, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart. If you're living in guilt, if you've been walking around saying, I'm, I can never get over sin, and the enemy is consistently bombarding your mind, 
this morning, would you speak the truth of the gospel back to him and remind him that you belong to Jesus, that when Jesus looks at you, you are cleansed, forgiven, that you are no longer defined by what you've done or how much you failed or when you failed or where you failed or who you've hurt or what you've done. You are brand new. You have a fresh start. You belong to Jesus. Examine your hearts this morning. Examine your minds this morning. If you're living in guilt, can I encourage you this morning, come to Jesus. Spend some time with Jesus this morning. Whenever you're ready this morning, the elements are ready for us to come. Remember the work, the price that was prayed so that we no longer have to live in guilt. We no longer have to live in shame. We no longer have to live in fear.